you have your Bibles, so please open your Bibles with me uh, this morning to Mark uh, chapter 10. If you are joining us for the first time, we are going through, um, we've been going through a sermon series on the book of Mark, the gospel according to Mark. It's the second book of the New Testament. And uh, this morning, the title of the sermon is, What Must I Do to Inherit Eternal Life? Basically, what, what should I do to know for sure that I'm going to be in this place called heaven? And uh, this is exactly the question that the man is going to ask in our passage this morning. And I believe this is the most important question in life. If you haven't asked this question, then at some point in this life, possibly when you're closer, older in age, maybe in some kind of life-threatening situation, you will find yourself asking this question, what, what should I do? How can I know for sure that I'm saved? What does it mean to be a follower of Christ? So Mark chapter 10, uh, verses 17 to 31. If you don't have it, I can uh, I have it right up here on the screen and you can kind of follow along and then I'll pray and then we'll ask the Lord to speak to us through his word this morning. Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 31. It's titled, The Rich Young Man. The word of God reads, And as Jesus was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to the man, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at the man, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, see, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to our God for his word. Will you bow with me in prayer? As we ask the Lord to speak to us this morning. Father in heaven, we want to echo the words of our praise to you this morning. How great is our God. How great is the one who created all this universe, who created every living thing, who knows every one of us here this morning by name. Father, we pray this morning as we come before your word, we pray for hearts of humility, hearts that are teachable hearts that will lay down our pride and say, God, would you speak to me through your word? Thank you, God, that the Bible we all hold in our hands or even on our phones have a heartbeat and that your words are not just dead words of a novel. They are living words that can change our lives. And so we pray this morning that you would speak to us and convict us and challenge us and help us to see the love of Jesus Christ through this passage. Father, we 
love you, worship you, and thank you. And we pray this all in Jesus' name and all of God's people say amen. This morning, I'd like to ask you a question. And the question is this, if God asked you to let go of one thing in your life, what would it be? You know, some of us would be willing to give up our car. Some of us would be willing to give up our job. Some of us would be willing to give up the cash that we might have in our pocket right now, or maybe even the house we live in. Some things are easier to give up than others. But again, the question is, what would you say is the most difficult thing for you to surrender? Maybe something so important to you that you treasure it more than life itself. You know, this morning, I'd like to actually open with a, a short video clip, um, a short movie clip from 1989. And uh, this movie is uh, Indiana Jones. And uh, when I say Indiana Jones, probably a lot of the youth in college here might not know who that is. Um, but uh, Indiana Jones, he's the original explorer, uh, more original than Dora the Explorer or uh, Tomb Raider or Ben Gates played by Nicolas Cage in National Treasure. But in this film, Indiana Jones in the Last Crusade, um, he's an explorer. And so what he's doing is he's setting out on a journey. And in this movie, he's setting out to rescue his father. His father had disappeared because they were searching for this cup called the Holy Grail. And the Holy Grail is, uh, you know, by tradition, it's, it's actually, it's supposedly the cup that Jesus used during the Last Supper. And the scene that I would like to show you this morning, it's, it's a very short movie clip, um, is basically the end of this movie. So if you haven't seen it, I'm just going to spoil it for you, so too bad. Um, but what I want you to notice is how this Holy Grail or this cup, how it pulls at the heart of of people. So let's go ahead and cue that video clip. We're just going to watch a short video clip by way of introduction into the sermon. <laughs>
But the man in our story ends up choosing his possessions instead. In fact, what's so interesting about the passage that we're looking at this morning is of all the people who came to Jesus and had this kind of interaction with the Lord, this man is the only one who went away worse than he came. This is such a unique story in the gospel records. Why? Because there's no record of an individual who had such an intimate conversation with Jesus Christ and actually left away sad. Not rejoicing, not happy. The Bible says he left very sad. And we're told why he was so sorrowful and why he was sad. It's because the way to everlasting life was blocked by his unwillingness to surrender his possessions in order to follow Jesus. You see, the wealth that he had, instead of his wealth being a benefit, it was actually a barrier from receiving eternal life. Friends, the point is clear. Before we jump into our text this morning, the point that Christ is going to get at as we read the Bible is there, there can be no substitute God. That's the point of this text. The point of this text is any substitute God, whether it be your wealth or your materialism, relationships, your family, your children, your health, your possessions, an addiction, a status, whatever it might be, nothing says Jesus is allowed to come between the follower and the Lord Jesus Christ because Jesus is the King. Jesus is the King. So as we walk through this passage, we're going to see three points uh, this morning. The first point is we're going to see the love of Christ. We're going to see this beautiful dialogue, a very beautiful exchange between Jesus and this man. And what we're going to capture is the love of Christ. And then from there, we're going to see the tragedy of wealth. And now some people misunderstand. They think that the Bible is, you know, condemning wealth and condemning riches. No, that's not what the Bible is doing. This is not a condemnation of wealth, but it's the love of wealth or the love of money, or the way money can sometimes have a grip on the lives of people. And then the third point we're gonna see is the cost of discipleship. What to expect if you and I have signed up to follow Jesus Christ. And so let's go ahead and kind of walk through this passage. It's an incredible text, a very unique story. The love of Christ in verses 17 to 22. So as we look at verse 17, capturing the context, it says, and as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before Jesus and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The story that we're looking at this morning, it also appears in the Gospel of Matthew. It also appears in the Gospel of Luke. And when you look at these other Gospels and look at how they add other details, in each of the gospel versions of this story, there's a different factor added about this man that kind of makes him a celebrity or a celebrity status. And you look at the, the screen up here. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 20, it shows that, that this man was not just a man, but he was a young man. He was a young man. And then when you go to Luke and find this exact same story, Luke tells us that he was also a ruler. Uh, a noble, an aristocrat, and that he was not just rich, but what does the Bible say? Extremely rich, extremely rich. So as we look at this text and the, and the man that we're trying to learn about this morning, so we have a man, and this man, he's young, he's rich, he's coming to the right person, he's got lots of money, he's humble, he's on his knees, He's religious, he's kneeling before Jesus, he's showing respect, he's asking the right questions, he's influential, he's sincere, he's probably handsome, I don't know, I'm just reading into the text. But as you look at the way the Bible captures this man, he's perfect. He's perfect. On the outside, he's an ideal candidate for a disciple of Jesus Christ. Just looking at the story before we begin, this man would be the perfect deacon in the church. He's religious, young, rich, devoted, a commandment follower, rule keeper, as we're going to see in a moment. 
But despite the fact that he lived this very exemplary life, he boldly admits that there's still something missing. Even after following rules and having all the money in the world, he still comes to Jesus and says, what should I do to have this eternal life? I want you to notice that opening question. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This is the title of the sermon this morning, probably the most important question anyone can ask. The most relevant question for all of life. You see, this rich young man had heard about Jesus and probably watched Jesus. I mean, when you look at the passage right before verse 17, when you look at the earlier parts, Jesus was blessing the little children. You remember the sermon last week? Jesus was blessing the children. He was rebuking the disciples. This man probably saw all of that. A little before that, Jesus was doing this wonderful teaching on divorce, having a, a de- not a debate, but more of a discussion with the Pharisees. And this man probably observed all of that. And something in this man was awakened in his heart. And as he was listening to Jesus, and as Jesus started to leave the scene, this man comes running to Jesus and he kneels. He comes and he kneels. He runs and he kneels at Jesus. And he kneels at Jesus and says what? All right, how? Jesus, how? How do I, how do I get to this kingdom? How, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Friends, when you look at that question, there's a problem with this question. Look at that question carefully. There's a problem here. And the problem is this, with all the fine qualities that this young, rich ruler had, he still had a very shallow understanding of salvation because why? When you look at the question, he thought that there is something he could do. He thought there's something he could do. You see, this was a a common belief back in the day among the Jews and probably I would say very common today as well. A lot of people think that God is gonna one day add up your good works and your bad works and if If your good works exceed your bad works, then you're going to get into heaven. Notice Jesus' reply in verse 18. Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. When Jesus responds, he is confronting this man with two things. He is confronting this man with the identity of Christ and his personal identity. The Spirit of God, and this is exactly what what Jesus is doing. Jesus is saying, do you know who you're speaking to? Because you see, that word good was, was a marvelous word only attributed to God. And he's saying, do you know who you're speaking to? Do you know who I am? Only God is good. So if you're calling me good, you are declaring me to be God. You see, Jesus is confronting this man with those two things. The identity of who Jesus is, that Jesus is God, and also his personal identity, that he is somebody who needs God. And the work of God is to confront us, and that's exactly what is unfolding here. The work of God, the Spirit of God is confronting him with the identity of Christ. And who is Jesus? Jesus is God. Jesus is man. Jesus came to this earth 2,000 years ago. He lived the perfect life that we could not live. And then he went to the cross and he died the death that we should have died because of our sins. And on the third day, he rose from the grave. That identity of Christ, the Spirit of God is working through that one question right there. And then also confronting him with his own identity and how he needs Jesus Christ. How we all need Jesus Christ for salvation, then no one here can get to heaven on our own. What does Jesus say? Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And then he says, you know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, don't defraud, honor your father and mother. And this man said to Jesus, teacher, all these I have kept from my This young man is operating on the basis that is not unfamiliar today, that a good God will reward nice people for doing their best. That's what he thinks. 
you keep the rules, then you're gonna get to heaven. And when Jesus says to him, so how about these commandments? Are you keeping these rules? The young man replies, keeping the commandments, no problem. I've been doing all of this since I was a boy. This man is not trying to be funny here. He's being sincere. He's being sincere. I'm a pretty good guy, he says to Jesus. I'm a pretty good guy. I've kept all these rules. Everything you just said, Jesus, I've done it since I was a young little boy. But Jesus says there is one more thing to consider. And then Jesus says, looking at him, Jesus loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and then come and follow me. Verse 22, disheartened by the saying, the man went away sorrowful. Why? Because he had great possessions. Friends, I was thinking about that question. Would you go away sorrowful if you had great possessions? If you are someone who was extremely rich, would you be sorrowful? If you had just won $100,000 from a sweepstakes giveaway, would you go away sorrowful? Anyone? You'd be rejoicing. Pastor Michael, you won't believe it. I just won the lottery. You would be rejoicing. But this young man went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. Why? because he could see that there was no way you could serve two masters. You see, Jesus in that marvelous way, he had pierced right into the heart of this young man's life, right to the deep things of his spirit, and he had shown him that he was owned by another God. This young man who had everything money and power and youth could give him, he wanted something far more important and he saw it. He saw Jesus blessing the children. He saw Jesus rebuking the disciples. He saw eternal life, not just living forever, but a quality of life that he lacked and emptiness in his spirit that he could not fill. But he was sorrowful because he knew at the words of Jesus that he had to give up the other in order to have this. He could not have both. This is why he went away sad because he had great possessions and his possessions actually possessed him. And the disciples, they watched him go back up the road. You know what's interesting here is it says that he went away sad the Bible does not say that he went away angry and defiant. This man could have been angry and defiant, but instead he went away sorrowful, that he was disheartened by the saying, why? Because what he was hoping he'd be told by Jesus and what he was actually told did not fit. He was expecting Jesus to say, well, you're in. You've been following the rules? Join the disciples, you're in the kingdom, let's go. He was hoping to hear those words, but that's not what he heard. And because of that, he goes away sorrowful. Sorrowful. You know, it's kind of like uh, going to the doctor. We've all been to the doctor before. And maybe if you're like me, maybe if you go to the doctor and you go to the doctor, you say, hey, you know, I know, doctor, it's not time for my checkup. I know, I'm, I'm, I'm here a little early. It's not time for my checkup yet. I should be coming once a year. I know it's not time yet, but hey, I just showed up anyway because, um, you know, I'm doing well. Um, I'm healthy, I'm fit, I'm exercising, I'm eating well. I feel great. I don't have any pain in my body. A doctor, I'm feeling great. Can you just uh, write off my physical so that I can go on skipping up, up the street? All right, let's just get this done so I can go. What do you think a doctor will do? Well, some doctors might if they're, I don't know, I don't think any doctor will just write a okay and then send you off. A doctor will be like, whoa, hold up. Let's take a closer look. And sometimes a doctor will take a closer look. Maybe a closer look at the blood test or your body or maybe a mole that you had on your skin. And then he puts his finger on that spot and says, hold up, wait a minute. Something's not right here. You're sick. 
you have cancer. You discover something that you'd never known and the doctor puts their finger on that spot. Friends, that is an act of mercy. It's an act of mercy for Jesus to put his finger on the spot in this rich young ruler's life. The same way he put his finger on the spot in that Samaritan woman at the well. You know the story, and from John chapter four, Jesus goes to the well to get a drink of water. And Jesus says to this woman, he puts his finger on the spot and says, why don't you go call your husband and come back? And she says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus puts his finger on the spot again and says, you're right. In fact, you've had five husbands and the guy that you're living with now is not your husband. Question, why did Jesus do that? Why did he put his finger on the spot in this woman's life? Was it to condemn her? Was it to shame her? No. Jesus put his finger on the spot because he wanted to give this woman the very living water that would set her free from finding love in all the wrong places. Friends, why does Jesus put his finger on the spot in this rich young man? Was it to make him poor? Was it to impoverish him? Was it to condemn riches? Is this some kind of socialism in the Bible? Jesus puts his finger on the spot. Why? What does the Bible say? It's because he loves him. He put his finger on there because he loves him. And the Bible says, looking at him, he loved him. He loved him. This man would never have said, walking away from Jesus, you know, when that Jesus looked at me, oh, I just, I felt so condemned. I felt so shameful. When that Jesus looked at me, I saw the anger in his eyes. I felt so judged. This man would have never said that, never. This man would have left this encounter and he would have said, man, when that Jesus looked at me, it just felt like he loved me. It just felt like he looked right inside of me and yet he still loved me. Why couldn't I just do what he said? And disheartened, this man goes off sorrowful and sad, not angry, because he felt the love of Christ in that encounter. I remember back in college, sharing about what it means to follow Christ. I had a friend who was very much well into the weekend partying scene. You know, most people who are not believer, you know, believers, they live for the weekend, right? Gotta wait till Friday comes, gotta wait. Then Friday we party hardy, you know, Saturday party, Sunday we get our minds straight and they get back to school or get back to work Monday. That's, that's, the, that's the flow of the world. Everyone looks forward to the weekend. And I had a friend in college who was, I mean, he was always partying, always getting drunk. I remember one time I had to carry him physically because he passed out. And I remember I, sh I was sharing with him, this is what it means to be a follower of Christ. You need to walk away from all of that. And it means to have Christ as the greatest treasure. And I still remember what he said to me. I still remember him saying, I understand. Mikey, I understand. Everyone called me Mikey back then in college. They're like, Mikey, I understand what you're saying. I understand what it means to be a follower, but that is a sacrifice I'm not willing to pay. And he said, if that is what it means to be a Christian, then it would be a revolution in my life. And that is a revolution I do not want. And he went away sorrowful. The love of Christ was so present in that conversation. Jesus was not condemning, Jesus was not judging. It was because he loved him. Jesus put his finger on the spot and said, leave this so that you can have what is better. From the love of Christ, we have the tragedy of wealth. And as soon as this man walks off, what does Jesus do? Jesus looked around and he said to his disciples who are watching this whole dialogue, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God, exclamation mark. 
and the disciples, they were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. You know, there are many sayings, many hard sayings of Jesus, and this is one of them. Jesus says, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to Jesus, then who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Many sayings of Jesus that are hard sayings. You know, often people, they want Jesus' sayings to be nice and soft and cozy, which there are, but there are also hard sayings of Jesus, and this is one of them. And Jesus recognizes how easy it would be for this man or for any of us in this room to feel a false sense of security in stuff or in money or in possessions. And as a result, lose sight of what really matters. Can I ask all of us a question today? What matters the most in our lives? I don't know if you've ever caught yourself saying this, but have you ever said, as long as you're healthy, that's all that matters. Or as long as I have a job, that's all that matters. As long as I can pay the mortgage every month, that's all that matters. As long as I can get into college, that's all that matters. As long as I get good grades, that's all that matters. As long as I get married, whew, that's all that matters. As long as I have children, whew, that's all that matters. As long as I have a happy life, that's all that matters. No, it's not. See, the disciples, they were shocked. They were shocked at Jesus' declaration about wealth because in Jewish society, as it is today, oftentimes wealth was regarded exclusively as an indication of God's blessings. A lot of people today still cling to this error in spite of the message of Job. Look at the, the book of Job, the example of Christ, the apostles, the teaching of the New Testament. And therefore, any Jewish person listening to this conversation, observing this encounter, they were amazed at this exclamation that Jesus makes in verse 23. How difficult it will be for those who have money, for those who are rich, for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. The listeners would have said, are you kidding me? I thought philanthropy was the key. As long as you gave a lot of money to the church, as long as you got your name on some tall building, you're well in, and here comes the hard saying of Jesus. He says, how difficult, how difficult, how difficult. He says it twice. How difficult it will be how difficult it will be. And then what does he say? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. He uses a, a vaguely humorous illustration. He says something that probably the average four or five-year-old would know. Everybody look up here. So I brought, I brought a camel or a horse. It's the same thing, all right? And I brought, I brought a needle. This is a, a knitting needle. Just imagine there's an eye. There's kind of an eye, but... I want you to imagine, I have a two-year-old son, his name is Matthew, and uh, the, the phrase of the month, he has a new phrase every month, but this month the phrase is, you kidding me? He always says that, you kidding me? Yeah, you can ask him. Anyhow, but if I told my son Matthew, I said, Matthew, I want you to grab that knitting noodle that mommy uses, go grab it. So he grabs the knitting noodle, all right, noodle, noodle, needle, needle. He grabs a kneading needle, and I, told, I said, Matthew, I want you to grab the needle. So Matthew grabs the needle, and I want you to take your camel or your horse, and I want you to put this horse through that small little eye of the needle. I want you to try to fit it right inside. And you know, my son Matthew would probably take the tail and probably try to put it in here. He'd probably squish it all into a small and just, you know, try, to, try to stick it in here, right? But after doing all of that, I think what Matthew would say is, you know what, Daddy, are you kidding me? You kidding me? It's not gonna fit, Dad. Daddy, no. You kidding me? No. It's not gonna happen. There's no way. It's probably
probably the same reaction of the disciples. You know what's interesting is some commentators on this passage, they kind of attempt, they attempt to soften this language by explaining this eye of the needle. You see, back then, eye of the needle, it referred to a tiny gate about four feet high located in the wall of Jerusalem. And they said that some camels, if some camels get on their knees and they kind of squirm, then they can actually go through this little opening that they called the eye of a needle in the wall of Jerusalem. This is not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is not referring to this. Jesus meant a literal needle. A literal needle. A literal needle. And he says, if you want, you can make a big sewing needle if you want. With an eye, you can put a string through it. And it says, imagine a huge, lumpy camel trying to squeeze through the eye of a needle. And you get the picture that the disciples got. It's impossible. Everyone turn to your neighbor, it's impossible. Other neighbor, it's outrageous. And that's the point. Everyone look up here, that's the point. That's the point. That's why in verse 26, it says they were exceedingly astonished. Wow, they started off amazed and then they were exceedingly astonished couple more notches up. They said, well, Jesus, then who can be saved? What rich man will ever make it if that's what riches do to you? And what does Jesus say? Jesus says, with man, it is impossible. Let's, let's just stop right there for two seconds. Let's hang on that thought for a moment. With man, it is impossible. Let me ask you a question. Why is it impossible? What do riches do? What does money and wealth and affluence, what does it do to a person that makes it so impossible? What is it? It's clear from the context, especially from the passage before Jesus was talking to the little children, saying the kingdom of heaven belongs to children such as these. Jesus is saying what? Riches, money, wealth, affluence, they destroy the qualities that you must have in order to enter the kingdom of God. They destroy the childlikeness of life and you can see why. I believe every one of us in this room are a part of the wealthy, especially if, you, if we live in this country. The wealthy are not worried about where their next meal is gonna come from. Instead, they worry about what it's gonna taste like what the setting will be. The wealthy are not concerned about whether they will have a roof over their heads and clothing to wear. Instead, they're concerned about fashion and style and decor. The wealthy may not be concerned about whether they worship God rightly or not, but whether they are in a beautiful and comfortable building like this one, which meets their expectations. Friends, the wealth can transfer our concern from necessary things to secondary things, which is why Jesus says, you must become like a child. Jesus says, you must have faith like a child, not don't be childish, big difference. Not a childish faith, but a childlike faith. A wonder at the things of God. A genuine love for who he is to enter the kingdom. And that's why Jesus says it's impossible, but not with God. And this is the note of grace. With men, it is impossible, but not with God. God can break that enslavement to riches, and he does. And he does. It's impossible for a man to save himself, but God saves people. God is the only one who saves people, and God saves people according to the counsel of his will as men and women do what Jesus has said, to repent and believe in the good news. Can we hear amen to that? A lot of people ask me, well, what happens when you truly become a Christian? What happens? Do you feel, I know some people, they feel different, right? Some people, they, you know, if, if you put a Christian who becomes a Christian at the moment of their conversion, you put them under an x-ray machine, you wouldn't be able to see anything, nothing. But what distinguishes someone when they become a Christian is there are new desires. There is a birth of new desires. That's how you know for sure that you're a believer. 
The Bible says in Ezekiel, wonderful, wonderful passage. God says, I will give you a new heart, not a refurbished heart, not an improved heart. No, a brand new heart, something out of nothing, and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove that heart of stone from your flesh. I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. I'm going to put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. How do you know you're a Christian? If you're someone here this morning and you're not sure, I don't know, I've been to church all my life. Am I really Christian? Am I not? The question is this, are there desires, desires to know God, to read His Word, to walk with Him, to obey Him? We're not talking about works righteousness. I'm talking about are there desires to know God? It can only be birthed by the Holy Spirit. It is the work of God, start to finish. Salvation is not human achievement. It's purely the work of God, where the Spirit of God takes the Word of God and gives all of us the new life of God. Can we hear amen to that? This is the tragedy of wealth. As we close, the cost of discipleship. Jesus now sets forth what happens to those who serve him. He says, Peter began to say, See, we've left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, lands with persecution. Do you see that? With persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last shall be first. Peter observed Jesus' dialogue with this rich young ruler, and characteristically, we know Peter's personality from the Bible. He couldn't keep his mouth shut. So he's literally thinking what? Jesus, that's not fair. That's not fair. Peter wanted to know that he and the other disciples, they were going to get for their willingness to leave everything. And so as we look at that statement, see, look at that statement right there. See, we have left everything and followed you. When Peter says that, I really believe a lot of us in the church, he speaks for many of us gathered in the church today. Many of us are also faithful in our Sunday worship attendance. Many of us are also faithful givers and tithers to the church. Many of us are willing to roll up our sleeves and serve in multiple capacities. And while you and I may not be as blunt as Peter, at some level we might be asking Jesus the same thing. Jesus, what about me? Jesus, will my faithfulness be rewarded? Look at all the things that I've done for the church. So Peter speaks for many when he makes this emotional statement, what's in it for me? And what is Jesus' response? So reassuring and revealing at the same time. What does Jesus say? Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you. Jesus says, do you think for a moment that you could give up anything that I would not give back to you a hundred times over? Jesus speaks of the sacrifice and loss that we must endure if we would put the kingdom of God first. He's not literally saying, throw away your family, throw away your house, throw away your job, throw away it. That's not what Jesus is saying. He is saying, is Christ first in your life? Is he the greatest treasure? Like I said in the very beginning of this sermon, Is there a difficult thing in your life other than Jesus? Is there a difficult thing that you would have so hard to just let it go? Or what matters the most in your life today? Jesus states that all these things that we love must come second to our first concern, which is following Christ. And then he promises what? That in this age, in this time, We will have a hundred times more of all that we may sacrifice, but with persecution. With persecution for those who follow Christ. Jesus says that I'm about to suffer. You're going to suffer if you follow me with persecution. And many who will be first will be last, and the last shall be first. 
This rich young ruler stood first, the poor disciple stood last, but God saw things from the perspective of eternity. The first became last while the last became first. Those who are first in their own eyes will be last in God's eyes, but those who are last in their own eyes will be rewarded as first. What an encouragement for true disciples of Jesus Christ. Friends, as we close, this rich young man was hoping to find the one thing that would close the deal for him. But this is what he discovered. This rich young ruler discovered that he had a covetous heart. And Jesus called him to repent and believe the good news. And in, in, in his case, that meant turning away from all the stuff that he owns. But he goes away sad. He goes away sad. He was sorrowful. But as we close, looking at the Bible, there's actually another man who is very short. His name is Zacchaeus. We all know the story. He was up on a sycamore tree, and Jesus comes to the house of Zacchaeus. And when Zacchaeus tastes the goodness of Jesus Christ, what does Zacchaeus say? Zacchaeus says, I will give away half of my wealth to the poor, and anybody that I've cheated, I'm going to pay them back quadruple times repentance and Jesus stands on the doorsteps of Zacchaeus's house and he says today salvation has come to this house because of this man can Jesus stand out on the front of our porch can Jesus stand at the front of every one of our homes or apartments or condos or wherever we live? And can Jesus also say salvation has come to this house? Or are you and I just like the rich young ruler? We're just a nice guy, a nice lady, interested in eternity, trying to do our best, living in the hope that a good God, if he exists, will reward nice people for trying that best. If that was the story, this encounter would not be in the Bible, friends. But it is in the Bible because that's not the story. Jesus says the time is fulfilled, kingdom is near. Jesus says repent and believe in the good news. Can we hear amen to that? Repent and believe in the good news. As we go into prayer before we take communion, the question I'd like to ask you is, if Jesus were to put his finger on the spot in your life, what would it be? Would it be your marriage, possessions, your wealth, your pride? What is it that you cannot let go to truly follow Christ? Let's bow together in prayer.